My name is Val Leitner. This is an oral history recording on the 11th or on the 1st of November 2017 of Penny McCain. This is part of the Seahorse Key Oral History Project for the uh, Humanities in the Public Sphere grant. And today, Kenny will talk about his experience both working with University of Florida on Seahorse Key and also um, as a community member and seventh generation Cedar Key um, resident. So welcome, Kenny. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So Kenny, I, I'd like to start a little bit with uh, some introductory information uh, with you growing up with in Cedar Key, memories of Seahorse Key, um, perhaps your earliest memories of UF being on uh, Seahorse Key, and then going a little bit into your work with the refuge and giving a little bit of background um, of Seahorse Key as part of the wildlife refuge. So if we could start with you, as uh, memories of Seahorse Key growing up here in, in Seahorse uh, Key. Growing up in Cedar Key, we knew it was there. We thought the university owned the island. And then later on in years, when I went to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's when we realized, I realized then that the university doesn't own it. They just lease the middle part of the island. Uh, most of the stuff when I really got involved with uh, knowing more about the island was in the uh, around about 73. Uh, had a classmate of mine, Bo Havens, his dad was a caretaker out here, Chuck Havens. So Bo talked a lot about working on the island with his dad and coming out. So that's when, that uh, was 1970, that was third grade. <clears throat> so that's when we, you know, would hear more stories about the snakes and birds and stuff over here, Bo working with his dad, so. And are there any stories that are part of the community lore about the island, maybe about the snakes or the birds or anything like that, the lighthouse being haunted that you can remember? Yeah, they were, you would hear the older generation of seahorse come up, they'd tell you the stories of, you know, the headless pirate out here, and there's a headless horseman, lady horseman, uh, that would be out here too. So you'd have those folklores, you know, going around just telling us kids that, you know, the horror stories out here and stuff like that there. And, and then they'd mention the snakes and the birds and you just didn't come out here. The biggest reason you didn't mess around the islands was the mosquitoes. You know, people just didn't come up on the island, Seneo to Seahorse, North Key, because the mosquitoes, especially during the summertime, were really bad, so. So do you think those stories were meant to keep y'all away as kids? No, it was just okay. stories to, you know, scare you, get your hackles up on the back of your neck and stuff like that there. And, and depending on who you, you know, was telling the story, they would have their own little flair to it, you know, and just try to scare if I mean, We'd go over to Bo's house and his dad, uh, we called him Mr. Wart, that was his nickname, I guess, but Charles Havens was his name. But, you know, he'd tell us different things, you know, about the, the stories out here, the ghost and all, and mainly it was the same story. He'd put a little different to it and then always, all the time talking about the big snakes and stuff like that there, so. Do you remember that ghost story? No, not right off, you know, because it's just, long time ago but they was talking about if he if he brought a class over here especially in the evening and night on full moon nights you know they'd be he could you know hear galloping on the back beach he's heard that many a times and they'd be the headless uh horseman or there's a uh, some lady over here uh, i forget what the story was on her but she was headless too and then there was also one that um, she drowned or something during the Civil War and she would be up around by the house and stuff like that there. So. Were there any stories surrounding the cemetery at all? No, not many. They didn't mention much about the cemetery or anything down there. So. Okay. So now moving forward a little bit, could you describe Seahorse Key's 
situation with the federal government and with the wildlife refuge and with the uh, UF? Well, the Cedar Key National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1929. Seahorse Key did not come into the refuge system until 1936. I think they got it from Department of Treasury is who had it once it shut down as an active lighthouse. It was leased by a private individual. When it come into the refuge system in 1936, they continued to honor his lease. So, and he had leased it right on up until 1950. And he was moving his operations down to Crystal River. And that's when he approached the uh, University of Florida because they were wanting to start a marine biology uh, class. And he said, I've got a perfect place for y'all. And that's take over my lease from, you know, with the federal government on Seahorse Key. And so that's what they did, went in agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. At that time, the island now is administered out of the Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge, which was established in 1979. Prior to that, uh, Cedar Key National Wildlife Refuge was run out of the, they call it the Crystal River Complex now, but it's actually Chazawiska National Wildlife Refuge. And then later on, Crystal River National Wildlife Refuge was there, and that's now it's the Crystal River Complex. Prior to that, I think in the 60s, all of this was administered out of the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge down at Sanibel. So there wasn't a lot of presence of federal, you know, agency stuff up here until it come out of Chazawiska. Once Chazawiska, they would come up and do bird surveys and all, so. But then when the Cedar Key National, or Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge, it was established in 1979. It wasn't staffed till 1986. Cedar Key National Wildlife come under their administration protection. We, there were never no staff out here. It was a non-staff refuge. But, you know, we come out and put up signs, done bird counts, and you know, checked in to see what the university was doing, so. And do you know what was happening with this lighthouse structure where we are right now during that time? During the... The time when, uh, you know, there isn't really much supervision or... Mainly uh, prior to 1950, before the university come here, it was leased by a private individual that just used it for his private use. He would come out with his family, they would stay here, and uh, I think it was getting run down a little bit also, because um, I know once the university took it over, there was some documentation to where, you know, they come in and done some upkeep on it, and their agreement with the government is to maintain the lighthouse. And it's an own, I mean, before I, I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service for 24 years, and, you know, it's was known that if the university was not here with a lighthouse, the Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't have the means to upkeep this. So it would probably be, you know, in, I would think in disarray. So, but the university spends, you know, quite a bit of time and effort of keeping this up. So I know when I started working here in 2014, the first six months, there was 23 days that me and my wife didn't come out here and do some type of maintenance or yard clearing or something, you know, to get the place back up pretty shapeful or what we thought it needed to look like, so. So when you worked uh, for the Lower Swanee Federal Wildlife Refuge, is that right? Yeah, Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge. National Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. When you worked in that capacity, what relationship did you have with this island? Um, in 92 is when we put the signs up. We actually closed the waters down around Seahorse Key, 100 yards out from the mean high water mark. And so it was closed from March 30th, March 1st through June 30th, and that was to protect the colonial bird nesting. And prior to that, which I started in 1990, but prior to that, the university during bird nesting time was limited on what they could do out here. Um, like the cemetery trail was closed down because 
now nothing nests here they left but before that in the 90s when i started coming out here even back in the 80s and the 70s we'd take field trips and stuff the pelicans it would just they would be all down and all the trees going down to the cemetery all around the lighthouse it was actually a place that you really didn't want to come to it stunk it was noisy and you know in the 90s when i started working here i would go up in the lighthouse you know doing law enforcement or just out here and that's when i seen how brutal you know wildlife is because if you had a baby pelican from one nest get into another nest you know the parrot would just take the beak and beat on it or the young would take and beat on it and it was like oh man this is really you know brutal stuff it's you know it's not like oh well we got a little baby pelican over here let's get it back to its nest i mean they'd just start beating on it with those long beaks so and it was common to find birds when we started having open houses after I went to work with the government to find birds that had fell out of nest and stuff. And, you know, undoubtedly people would bring them down and, oh, we found this bird. And we'd try to tell them, you know, it's a national wildlife refuge. It's, you know, we let nature take its course because you couldn't go around and just pick up all the birds that was falling out of nest. That's the way of nature of weeding out. I mean, if we, if every bird that, or every egg that was laid hatched out and went to maturity, we would just be covered up with stuff, so. So, when you worked for the refuge, you were here for law enforcement and you did bird counts as well. Yes. Did you do any, and I know you also did fire management for the refuge. Did right. you ever do any vegetation management on the island? Not on the island, we did not. You know, the university was responsible, like if we had an open house, they were responsible for mowing the grass. Uh, in the early stages of my, you know, being involved with the refuge and the island, the university had to get permission to cut a tree down. So if there was a tree that was dead, they would actually have to get permission. And over the years, that has progressed to where, you know, the university, as long as you're using sound mind and good judgment, we don't want it to look like a sand dune like 10,000 years ago. But, you know, if there's a dead tree that needs to be coming down, you know, now I don't have to call the refuge and say, hey, I got a dead cherry laurel or dead red bay. I've got quite a few of them. Uh, you know, I can call them and say, hey, I've got a tree down and they'll come help me with it, but I'm not having to call to, you know, get permission to underbrush. Uh, last year, the university leases from the center line of the sidewalk, it's 125 feet to the west and 150 feet to the east. And uh, so what they done, Andrew and Larry Woodworth, who's a refuge, Andrew is the project leader, they call him, and Larry is the deputy project leader. We come out and measured out and we put flagging up. So they were some kind of thing about what we were doing and outside of our scope and stuff. So we flagged off the boundaries and pretty much long as we stay within those boundaries, use good sound judgment, you know, we can kind of underbrush, open things up you know, cutting down on mosquitoes and used to be for snakes, kind of getting underbrush back so you could actually see snakes. But now with the birds gone, we don't see many snakes up around the house or anything. So, so now as of this date in 2017, it seems that in one capacity or another, you've had a professional relationship with the island for about 25 years or so. Yes. So in that time, what are some changes that you have seen with maybe the bird counts that you've done or the vegetation or law enforcement, etc.? Well, in 1990, when I started doing bird counts, it was nothing to count 18 to 20,000 birds. And majority of those be an ibis. And so when we started doing them, you know, the bird count consists of coming out, setting for a three hour period. We'd get here seven o'clock in the morning and stay till 10. And what you done was for three hours, counted everything in and out. And I was the tally person and then we'd have two spotters on there. And when I started in 1990, you didn't talk because there were just so many birds. Now we didn't count cormorants and pelicans. They do today. So that's the reason your numbers are not, you know, reflective on what it was. 
But so during those times, you just, I mean, for three hours, it was just writing, and we was waiting on 10 o'clock to just stop, you know. And as it progressed down, the number of birds started decreasing, especially around 96, that's when they started going down. Um, 10 year average rainfall in 1990 when I started because I started a forester and fire program on the Lower Swanee Refuge so I was in charge of all the weather and back then we had to do an annual narrative so it was my job to write the narrative for the weather part and we we're on a subtropical line uh, right close to it so our 10 year average rainfall then was 56 inches a year and in 2005, when I went full-time law enforcement, 10-year uh, average was 38 inches a year. And where that significant is, a lot of the ibis, herons, and egrets have to feed their young freshwater fish. So they're basically going to the Swanee River Basin or the Walkasassa Basin. So the Swanee River Basin is 10, 12 miles to the northwest. Walkasassa Basin is 10 or 12 miles to the southeast. So as that rainfall, you know, started diminishing, you levels of uh, fresh water up in the basins up in there was dropping. So places when I was doing law enforcement burning, used to go out and check. We didn't have GPS's and all. When I started, you had an aerial photo. And I'd put it up, I didn't even have a light table. I'd take, tape it to the window in the office, draw a map by hand. And then, you know, I'd take that out and go make notes on it and everything. But places that I used to, you know, walk to that'd be knee deep in water and, you know, starting in probably around 2000 when it was really noticeable, you could walk out there and not even get your feet wet, so. So bird counts, you would say, is the most significant difference that you've seen in the 25 years? Yeah, I kind of got off on that. But yeah, the bird counts. And uh, the public use, you know, the fishing around the island is pretty much staying about the same. When we first put the signs up, we got, you know, we put them up because that was the best fishing spots and all that. And it was like, no. And we were basically looking and uh, focusing on where the ibis were nesting because they were the big deterrent uh, or they were more susceptible to human interference. If you kept coming up around, they would actually abandon the nest. So that's what we were protecting. Uh, pelicans and cormorants, they could give two cents about what you was doing, you know. And then the other birds, their numbers wasn't very big, but they were nested more you know, higher up and inland and stuff, so. But yeah, the bird, the bird count, you know, bird use out here has changed. And then the other thing on the island part is erosion on the back beach. Uh, when I started, the first major storm we had that I can remember when I first started was No Name Storm in 93. And it took 35 feet of the back beach off. Uh, where it was just a switchback trail all the way down, uh, it come to where it was just a bluff. And that's when we had to build the first set of steps. We actually built a landing and then a set of steps down to the beach. And then uh, you had to, you know, once that happened, I don't know what it done to the vegetation, but it seemed like you, you were having more erosion just from your normal, you know, summertime southwest weather, stuff like that. Their fronts coming through, seemed like it was encroaching more and more. And then 2004 and five, we had the hurricanes. And then uh, another significant one was Hurricane Hermine. Uh, it took more of the toe of the island, but it made more of the beach longer. It took more toe of the bluff off to where No Name Storm of 93, the way it come in, it took bluff beach and all. So, but yeah, the, the erosion on the island on the backside and then, you know, the birds are two biggest things, so. Thank you. So you began working for UF in 2014? 2014, February 24th. I retired from the government on the 22nd and come to work here the 24th. 
And what is your title with UF? Uh, I think it's boat captain, or now is it marine director? Director of Marine Operations or something like that, there. but it's basically boat captain, and you know, fall under that duties of all the maintenance on the island, maintenance of the boats, you know, participating in everything because all the power is generated by generators, keeping those up, you know, keeping them fuel, maintenance to the house, and that's a constant, you know. There's constantly something, you know, some type of maintenance to do to the house. And a lot of it's just you do your time management and organization because you can't just, with all the other duties, we've got classes coming out. Uh, this past week we had, uh, or last week we had four days of classes. Uh, high school classes out of Gainesville, Buholtz, and, uh, or Eastside, I'm sorry, Eastside and in Oak Hall. So you can't just be doing maintenance then. So once you have your breaks, that's when you jump in and get your maintenance done on your boats and the island out here. So um, I'd like to read you a little excerpt from this book to Brooks Campbell, who was the original caretaker, once you have took over the island. And this is from the 25th of October, 1959, from Elo Pierce, who's the director at the time. And this letter describes, I'm just going to read you snippets, what... Brooks, uh, what his responsibilities were. And I'd like to get your opinion on that and perhaps why the responsibilities have changed over time to what your responsibilities are today. So, for example, it says, uh, well, first of all, that his uh, salary will be $3,400 a year. And he says um, that he, Brooks is expected to be on the island six days a week with one day off. And that either he or his brother was expected to be on Seahorse every night. So even though his brother wasn't employed by the university, if he was gone, his brother had to be there. And that it was understood that Brooks' wife would be there, but he was expected to maintain the boats, motors, equipment, buildings, and it included painting, carpentry, keeping the yard, and buildings clean. And uh, it was also his job to keep an eye out for anyone, and I'm quoting here, who might molest the wildlife, build fires, or trespass in a fashion which would be harmful to our interests. And then it says, um, one of your most important duties will be to meet people who wish to collect specimens from the waters around Seahorse. And then, of course, he, he did also ferry people back into the island. And in another letter, uh, dated the 11th of March, 1960. This is more of a general letter from Elo Pierce to Brooks, and he talks about a group that's coming out to the island that he's going to ferry out. And he says um, that they'll arrive on Friday and they'll leave on Sunday, and uh, that they would like to have your wife prepare the meals for about 12 students. And this is in the lighthouse. Um, most of the students operate on small budgets, so I suggested $2 per student for three meals. This will amount to a total of $4 per student for the six meals. It would be a convenience for these people, and I hope your wife can come out ahead. Simple food in large quantity is what they will need. And um, so it, it's very obvious that his wife was as much a part of, of this as, well, not as much a part, but a significant part. And uh, so please talk about your perspective on that and the differences. Well, that's just the change of times now. Okay. You know, you got your Fair, stay, uh, fair Labor Standards Act, stuff like that there. Um, when I went to work with Division of Forestry, talking to a lot of the older forest rangers there, that's how they were. They, you work six days a week when you work with the state with one day off. And that one day off could have been taken off in the same way with Brooks. Uh, Mr. Brooks, uh, you know, that was just your standard then. Now the way, you know, that I'm hired is uh, I was hired as a team's member 40 hours a week and just recently, last year, I was put on salary. And salary goes to a different category then and you pretty much, you know, asked to work till the job's completed about what you know they they were telling mr brooks 
Uh, you pretty much try to stay within your 40 hours, but you know, like last week, we had all the classes. This past weekend, I had one on Saturday. Uh, I don't think we done anything Sunday. I had some boat maintenance stuff to do, but then all this week we've been working. So as uh, far as Rose or the wife helping, like I say, the first, I think it was up until last year when she had some medical stuff that she didn't start coming out as much. And things had changed a little bit. It had more players in, but till then, I mean, she she worked, I think they hired me to get to her because she worked just as hard, if not harder, than I did. Uh, as far as construction, you know, carpentry, electrical, plumbing, um, the kitchen, me and her completely redone, sanded floors, painted, built the new cabinetry in there, you know, and, and everything done on the island has to be hauled out here. And there was 180 something boxes of stuff we had to bring out for the, you know, to upgrade the kitchen. And so a lot of the same duties are there. It's just the way, you know, that they can only work you so much now. And we're back in the 60s. You just, they tell you, hey, we want you to work. Uh, they couldn't work you more than six days a week. And uh, I think Mr. Brooks or AD were the last ones that were required to stay on the island at night. So I think when uh, Lee Belcher started, I don't think he was required to stay here. So, and far as cooking now, uh, most of that stopped. They would have the high school programs during the summer when Henry Colter was here, him and his wife, and they would cook for the high school program. And that was the only one that they still cook for up until recently. Um, Maria Scambody was in Jen Seavey. When they would have the high school programs out, they would, you know, they would get the grocery list, kind of have a, a meal uh, lineup, uh, meal roster. But they would also ask some of the kids, you know, okay, you're going to be cooking Tuesday night. What's your favorite dish you'd like to help cook with? And so they would kind of send them a recipe. They'd get all the ingredients for that, and then the kids would, you know, under their supervision cook. But all the other classes, the college and stuff like that there, they all bring their own food and cook. Some of them cook in groups, uh, like the one we've got over this weekend coming out. Uh, they will pretty much everybody bring their own stuff, you know, to cook. But the ones that stay multiple nights, they normally have, you know, a group cooking. They, this, this night is, you know, these two people cook, these clean. They kind of separate around, so we're not required to cook no more. I do have to bring the water over, fresh water drinking water. Uh, the water on the island here is not uh, potable water. You can you know, wash dishes with it. There's nothing that's going to hurt you, but they don't recommend to drink it. So I bring fresh water, drinking water over for them to use, to have, to drink, and a lot of them cook with it too, so. Thank you. So I also have a list here, and there are many of these lists that Brooks Campbell in his nearly 10 years, tenure here would write, and usually they're in six month increments. and. It's usually a handwritten list like this where he uh, does it by month and he lists all the things that he did each of those months. So, for example, in July 1965, he writes that he pulled the urchin, which was the boat at the time, or the main, the largest boat at the time, copper painted the bottom, pulled fiberglass boat, cut oak sprouts, and hoed up grass, raked the yard. So that was July, for yeah. example. So, um, you know, I think about the ways that are down there that aren't used anymore. So it seems that because some of the infrastructure has changed here on the island, that some of your duties have also changed as well. Um, or no? No. Uh, we've got a discovery, 42-foot, 16-foot beam. I would love to have the ways operational to put the discovery on. What we do now, my duties are, is I have to carry it to Crystal River. Uh, to the marina down there, they actually have a travel lift. They set this 15-ton boat out of the water, 
and walk two or three hundred yards over there and set it down on blocks and block it up and so now I'm driving the Crystal River. It normally if we rush it we can get we we, we do it in a week's time because they give you they like for you to have your boats in and out in seven days. Because the first seven days is twenty five dollars a day. They cost it cost us twelve dollars a foot to have the boat set out, then twenty five dollars a day sitting in the lot for the first seven days. After that, then it goes to forty five dollars a day. So we're driving, you know, we're leaving before dark, going down there, pressure washing the bottom, scraping, uh, sanding, and then repainting. Uh, this last time, I had to pull the props, get them sent off. The next time it comes out, uh, I try to do it like every 18 months. Uh, some say every year you need to do it, but it's just with the logistics of it and stuff like that. In between the pullouts, I will scrape the bottom. We pull it up on sand point. I have a hooker rig. I go underneath and scrape it. It just gives you better fuel mileage and stuff. So the next time we go down, uh, there's, I'm hoping to keep it out at least two weeks. And that's because we've got, we'd like to take the bottom paint down a little bit further than we've been able to. There's a few blisters I would like to get fixed. And I'm still working on, with our administration, their shafts, I need to replace the shafts on that boat. So, and probably cutlass bearings, but we do all that stuff ourselves. Um, once I first started doing it, I carried it down and they said, oh, get a price for somebody to do it. And it was $3,000 for them to do the bottom. And that did not include the paint. The paint costs normally $1,200. So we use a Woolsey, Woolsey brand, I think it is, but it's a bottom paint. And I uh, wish we still had old copper paint because that worked a lot better. <laughs> But this new stuff here is an anti-fouling paint. Stuff still grows to it, but it pops off real easy. So normally it's $1,200 just for that. So, And then they wanted $3,000. And when I told our folks that, and it was like, uh, what truck are you driving down there? <laughs> you know, it's, it wasn't, no, oh, get somebody else. It was like, what truck are you driving? So. So do you think it would be possible to put in a ways that you could use for the discovery here? Uh, no, they probably with all the permitting, DEP and stuff like that there, I don't think they would let you do it. it you know, in Cedar Key, they used to be 12 sets of waves around there. And every, that's how everybody with their big boats pulled them out. Um, now the only other couple big boats in town, they're, you know, they've got boat trailers they can put them on. They're single screw boats. They're 32. 34 foot but with a discovery with a 16 foot beam and all you could make a tray get a trailer for it but you know you couldn't pull it nowhere i could pull it out at the marina you know do some work there on it and put it back in but you know having a trailer wouldn't be then you'd have to have a truck big enough you know to pull it up and pull it out so uh, my long-term goal is they'd have the new nature coast biological station they built is actually have a lift for the discovery. So you come in after you research stuff, you lift it out of the water, you know, then you don't have to worry about the bottom, you know, stuff growing on it. And uh, with a lift there, I could lift it and pull the shafts and do stuff right there, you know, so. But that's $50,000 down the road, so. <laughs> it's a wish list. Uh -huh. but. But yeah, so you know, all the same duties are still here. I, I do all the mowing, you know, trimming back, and it's just once again time management. Uh, before all the open houses now, they have four a year. I come out, make sure everything's mowed and, and you know, cleaned up. And I, I want to clarify mowing is I do a lot of weed eating up on the high ridge up here because when you do, run the mower over it, it pulls it up and it becomes a sand hill again. And so we're trying to you know, have some type of little cover that the wind's not blowing the dirt around and stuff like that there. That's just my opinion. That's the way I do things. So, And you know, after every windstorm, you're going around picking up palm fronds and stuff like that there. So, And then we had Hurricane Irma. We didn't have no flooding 
with it, but we had a wind event and we had a tree fall down across the generator shed. So uh, to clean the yard up, we got a little yard trailer and what did we have? I think 32 loads of just yard debris. That wasn't the big trees that were down that we cut up and hauled. That was just picking up pond fronds and stuff like that there. And we had 32, 33 loads. We burnt for two days solid out here to just get that part cleaned up. And then after that, we had an open house. So for the ribbon cutting for the new station and part of that was to have the island open on that Saturday. So I had to put up a temporary generator because when a tree went on the house down there, it crushed electrical and the roof and all that. So I did get physical plant to come and help me redo the roof and they sent electricians down and then the propane piping and all, I done that myself. It was where stuff had twisted and moved and it was just leaking. So I had you know, to unhook all the generators and go back from it again and screw in pipes. You know, you un take everything apart and then you redope it, tightening everything all the way back up. So, I mean, it's just, it's a constant vigil, you know, keeping the grass clean. It's, we're going into the winter time now, so I've probably done the last little bit of mowing. But once spring gets here, it's, and, and I'll, I'll leave spots, you know, we have big butterflies coming through and there's, um, periwinkles coming up, the beggar weeds have a little, anything with a flower on it that the butterflies come to, I won't mow down. I'll let them utilize that. And then once it, you know, gets to that point, I'll mow it down. So, so, um, thank you. So, mm -hmm. Uh, one, I'd like to close up the conversation about Brooks Campbell yeah. and move along to some other caretakers. But uh, so Brooks, you said that you knew Mr. Brooks, mm -hmm. and uh, could you talk a little bit about him, about his character? What was he like? Uh, maybe tell a, a anecdote that might illustrate. Uh, Mr. Story. Brooks was a boat builder in town. And he had a little house right there uh, going past the schoolhouse. And he was there on the left-hand side. And he, he had a little old boat ramp. And he would build wooden boats right there in his yard and then slide them off on rollers down into the water. And so you'd go by and you'd talk with him about that. And he had all kinds of stories. I think he might have been in the Navy. I can't remember, but he would tell you stories like that. But then he became a medicine man. He produced medicine <laughs> as some type of elixir. And I mean, you'd be over at his house and they were folks calling all the time to get that. And it was made out of kerosene and all this stuff, but he bottled it up. And it was a liniment for achy joints and stuff. And I wished I'd have kept one of the bottles of the elixir he had, it, you know, liniment. It wasn't elixir, it was a liniment because the liniment you rub on you. But I mean, it stunk, Lord mercy, I don't know what. He was a secret, he wouldn't ever tell you what was in there. We knew kerosene was in it, so. <laughs> so he was a boat, boat builder and a medicine man, so. And he was old when I was young. <laughs> you know, he was just, Mr. Brooks was just a yeah, he's an old man all my life, you know, so, but he kind of character, he's always nice and, you know, but he, if you had a question about woodworking or boat building or something, he's one to go to and kind of talk with him and a couple others around, but the biggest thing he was known there toward the, toward the last was, you know, is a liniment that he sold worldwide, not just here around town, but it was, you know, worldwide, so. Wow. I was trying to think of the nationality he said just loves it. And I want to say, say he said the Japanese loved it. They were more into the herbal type medicine stuff. And, and the way he would put it would be, animal yeah, old Jap folks, they love that stuff, you know. So, <laughs> But it was pretty interesting to talk with him. So, so you said he was a boat builder. Uh, was he also a... A fisherman or a crabber? I ask because I have this, uh, again, another document from the archives when we processed all the old files. 
And this one is a letter to Elo Pierce from Edward Collingsworth, the refuge manager at the time from January 24th, 1968. And so he's, it's essentially a nasty gram to Elo Pierce about um, uh, Brooks Campbell's, um, okay, so it says, apparently Mr. Campbell is using the laboratory site as a base of operations for his crab trapping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so I didn't, I don't know, uh, based on this, if it's, uh, if that was really true or if he was just assigning that and maybe somebody else was doing crab trapping from the island. No, like I say, you know, 66, I wouldn't have remembered him much and, but yeah, he, I think he crabbed and he also fished. They'd crab more during the summer and then fish more during the winter time. So, but yeah, he, he, it wouldn't surprise me a bit that he didn't have crab traps down here, which most of them did, you know, they, they worked out here on the island. So, you know, $3,400 a year, I guess that was a pretty decent salary in 66, but, uh, or 1950. Eight, nine, when they hired him, but you know you still had to supplement. And if you got crabbing or fishing in your blood, you're you're still going to do it, you know. So, but yeah, that was probably running his crab trap right out of here. So, so aside from him, um, uh, do you have any other stories, anecdotes, anything you'd like to say about other uh, caretakers, boat captains, such as A.D. Folks or uh, Chuck Havens, for example? Uh, Mr. A.D. Folks, one thing that comes with us was talking with one of, they had a reunion out here, and one of the researchers was doing his project on IBIS. So he had a little pen down at the end, and now you got to realize that they're staying out here. You know, the researchers and Mr. A.D. and his wife lived on the other end, which, you know, they said that they taught a lot and, you know, they look at knots on the, the wood and stuff like that there on how clear it was. But anyway, he had his little pen for his research thing for the IBIS and he'd get fiddlers and stuff. Well, Mr. A.D. had his chickens. Well, his chickens kept getting into the test site. And I forget the guy, I think it might be Steve uh was his name but he's you know all time shooing them out and he said they were scared of mr ad because he's a big old fella too you know but he said mr ad was coming down the walkway and he uh he says hey your chicken's been in my test site again and he said mr ad just grabbed the chicken up wrung its neck and popped it you know which he ate the chicken and steve said he looked at him and he says and you're next <laughs> He said, scared him to death. And he said, you know, just rest of time. It was just like, stay away and don't even go to their end of the house. And, but he said, you know, nothing ever happened. He said, you know, Mr. A.D. was just good to him and, you know, taught him a lot and stuff too. But that one incident, he had like run at, wrung the chicken's neck and looked at him and said, you're next, you know, so. And uh, I went to school with uh, one of Lee's daughters, Cheryl. She was my classmate. Didn't hear much out of them because Lee was actually a marine biologist, and I think that's Lee Belcher. Lee Belcher, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, and I think that was one of their disagreements too was that you know he was wanting more money because he had a you know higher education and stuff. And but I never heard now when Mr. Chuck was out here, they was uh, Wart, Mr. Wart Havens, Chuck Havens is his name. Uh, but Mr. Ward was out here, they were constantly, you know, doing stuff, working on stuff, uh, you know, pull the boats up. And, and a lot of times you had the main caretaker and then they would have an assistant. And they, uh, when the assistants come in, the only ones I knew of, there was Jimmy Bainbridge and then Henry Colder. And then Henry took over Wart's place, and then they hired uh, Al Densmore after that. So Henry and Al, I don't remember if Mr. Chuck uh, Havens, if he retired or not. I don't think any of the other ones did. I don't think they put in enough time. Uh, Chuck Havens, Mr. Wart might have, but I know Henry and Al had enough time to 
uh, retire. And then they, you know, they would hire, uh, it could be three months or they might work them three months, lay off, and then three months again. Normally about six months out of the year they had an OPS person that would, you know, do painting, work on the boats, you know, when they pull the boats out, scrape the boats, paint them and stuff like that there. And uh, one of the ones there was um, K.C. Brown was his name. Uh, Kyle K.C. we called him. But he worked out here. And I remember Henry talking about him that I, that every other week that K.C. was painting the place. So Henry said he figured that year, that six-month period, they probably spent $1,000 in paint because every time they turned around, it was K.C. was wanting to paint the porch again or scraping down, wanting to paint something again, you know. And finally, Henry, well, we've done enough painting, you know. So, but uh, K.C. was the painter out here. He liked to keep things painted up, so... Uh, and what was Henry Coulter like? Henry was laid back, you know. Uh, back during that time, um, oh, trying to think of who the, who Henry worked under. Um, wasn't a peer, wasn't Mr. Elo Pierce. It was uh, Frank Maturo. Doctor Frank Maturo. But see, they actually taught classes out here. So they would, you know, be out periodically. Uh, every now and then you would have a high school class come out. Now, around town, if, you know, the high school wanted to come out, Henry would obligate them and stuff. They had uh, uh, Elo Pierce at that time. And it wasn't a, you know, it was a, wasn't a real big boat, but they would use it to come out. Mostly they used bird dogs, the old mullet boats, and that's what they'd bring the people out back and forth in, and they got a few skiffs and different types, but the big boat was Elo Pierce. But Henry was pretty much laid back, you know, and pretty much done what Dr. Matero wanted. And uh, so Dr. Matero was actually teaching marine biology classes out here. And then during the summer, they would take the Elo Pierce and they would go down to the Dry Tortugas or Fort DeSoto because he would be teaching down there. So they would carry the boat down so they could trawl off of it. And that was one of the reasons to get the bigger discovery with a cabin and, you know, bunk space, a head spot on it and stuff like that there. And then right after that, I think, is when... Uh, Dr. Maturo retired or right before that, so. So you mentioned the Elo Pierce, the research vessel Elo Pierce. Um, how familiar w were you with that vessel? Not much, I remember it, but I don't, you know, I don't remember doing too much with it. Uh, it was a Thompson trawler, the guy that owns uh, crawfish, or not crawfish, but uh, the shrimp place over at Titusville, where everybody goes to eat Dixie Crossroads. He, they're actually, he's the actually one that built it. There was Thompson trawler, and that's how they they got it. And they used it up till they had a survey on it and said the stern was rotten in it. And uh, this is just from talking with Henry, just getting history about the discovery, how we got it, and you know talking about the old Elo, Elo Pierce. But what they didn't realize, every time they pulled it out, they sanded down and they went through the gel coat and they would paint it back over, but you need a gel coat to keep water from penetrating. Even with paint on it, water will penetrate it unless it's gel coated good. Uh, same way with fiberglass. You can fiberglass something, but you need to gel coat it to keep the water from penetrating. And that's what had happened. They, they had sanded it just from too much maintenance and Henry said water got in there and they had some soft spots in the stern. And they sold that boat on state auction. Uh, Mr. Herbert Stevens, he was actually the police chief at UPD. They was one of his friends bought it and redone done a lot of work to it. And I'm wanting to say the last he knew the boat, it was maybe over around Stina Hatch area, somewhere there. He said left here and went to Crystal River and then I think over toward the Stina Hatch area. So. Still called the Elo Pierce? I can't, I don't know that one. 
So probably not. They probably would change the name of it, but I, I can't say for sure. So. And so then after the Elo Pierce comes the Discovery? Discovery, yeah. And do you know the story behind the Discovery at all and the procurement of the Discovery? Or? I, I don't know how they got the money appropriated, whether it come from legislature or a donor, but I think it come from legislature, I ain't for sure. Uh, they had, you know, made some contacts. We had a local representative here, Mr. Gene Hodges. He retired as a representative, and then he was director of DEP. And, you know, we grew up knowing, I mean, Henry and all of us knowing Mr. Gene, so it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, he didn't help on making contacts with a new, you know, Senate up there and the representatives. And Mr. Randolph Hodges was a retired senator, so a lot of connections to the political side up there that could have, you know, helped out. And then I think it come in at $187,000 in 1999. So, and it come in with twin screws, you know, bunk area, head, you know, 14, uh, 42 foot, 16 foot beam, enclosed cabin. And what it is is a Newton dive master, 42 foot dive master that they closed the cabin. They moved the cabin back, the bulkhead wall, and closed it in and put a door. Most of those dive master boats are open because they do going out and doing day trips. You know, they put on 30 divers, run out, do a dive, come back. So instead of this having a, excuse me, instead of this having an open stern, it has an open, it has a doorway where you can go out and uh, the dive platform I took off because we're pulling a side scan sonar and it was getting in the way of it so I took it off so we could pull the sonar behind the boat. So, so do you think that the discovery in it because of the boat that it is and its structure and its function is still a relevant vessel for the activities? Where we're heading with it now, yes. Um, it was built with the cabin with the intention of going down to the Dry Tortugas, Fort DeSoto, doing those research things. When Dr. Frank Maturo, when he retired, that program kind of stopped. They didn't go down. This boat's never been down south. And then what it basically was used for a taxi for the high school kids, you know, coming over, do a trawl off of it, come to the island, go back in. They was, the University Dive Club, they used it a couple times, um, you know, just doing day stuff, maybe go out overnight, you know, do water quality sampling stuff, you know, different groups and come back. Now we're contracting with FWC to do side scan work and once a month, sometimes twice a month, we'll go out for a four day trip and we have a they mount their winch on there. I, I mount the winch on, but it's their equipment and a side scan sonar. And what they're doing is we're going out four days at a time and we're scanning sites. Some of it's known areas where people have caught fish before, turn in their numbers, and everybody knows what the depth is, but they don't know what the topography is. So we go in, scan these sites, they randomly pick sites, and it's pretty interesting because nobody's fishing there, but normally it's sand bottom. So where people are fishing, you see stuff that's you start picking up rock. So we're doing that now. Then the next step is they will go back and put down camera traps and they will catch fish in these areas. They'll put the camera traps down, see what's there, catch fish in these areas, put tags in them, uh, acoustic transmitters. And then you got acoustic receivers that they've got along the whole Gulf of Mexico. And so now you can get the migration pattern because each species of fish has a different transmitter in it. So now you can get the movement of these fish because like now we got tons of red snapper up here, but there's none say in South Florida. So they cut red snapper off. Oh, we don't have our red snapper. Well, they moved up here. So now you can better manage the species. So that's what the discovery is. You know, we're, we're doing, um, there's a couple of people that's looking to go out and do water quality monitoring stuff to where they drop this 
thing that's got multimeters and all in it and as it drops down you know like in 30 40 feet of water it triggers at different depths to collect water samples and we have a power roller on the uh, discovery now that you know we can drop that down and then retrieve it back so so in doing your doing all the maintenance on the discovery you know i was thinking about that now and the cost of it now and what that looks like now versus uh for example the urchin back in 1966 and um so so for example this uh from the files, the total expenditure amount for the urchin for a nine month period for marine hardware, paints, engine parts, miscellaneous, gas and oil, which is the single largest expenditure, and insurance, which is the second single largest expenditure, is $1,569.83. I think that's just what the insurance costs on the Discovery now. For, for a month? <laughs> yeah, no, that's for a year. I think it's it's twelve fifteen hundred dollars for a year, and that's just hull insurance. And uh, it come up again, and they asked me, and I said, "What does it cover?" They asked me, "Did we need it?" And it's like, "What does it cover? <laughs> is it if we get in a wreck and the hull's damaged, or you know what what is the insurance we're paying on this thing?" And as uh, far as fuel, I burn in a Discovery, and this was with side scan work and all that there, ooh, what is it, uh, four, probably $4,000 a year in fuel. But you know, when we go off on these four day trips, we're looking at 500 gallons that I'm using. So, and you know, we're being reimbursed for that, but yeah, I'm burning that. Fixing to change the oil once a year, $450 to change the oil. 12 gallons of oil, two oil filters, because it's a twin engine. Uh, actually, it's 24 gallons of oil, two oil filters, two fuel filters. Uh, actually, three, four fuel filters, so. Wow. And then just your other maintenance stuff. I mean, cabin lights went out. They're $69 a piece because it's got marine on it, you know. And, you know, anything that's high, I just had to replace the raw water propellers. You know, they're $100 a piece, two of them. So, you know, probably the, I, I kept up with it one when I first started and, uh, Pulling out bottom paint and everything, you're probably looking pretty close to ten to twelve thousand dollars. For a oh, what uh, time uh, period? That's for a year. Really? Yes. So I'm looking at this letter again from the archival documents, and this is from May twelfth of nineteen sixty six from Donald McDowell, who's the director of the office of the business manager for University of Florida to Elo Pierce, and he's telling Elo Pierce. Uh, that they cannot charge more than $5.83 an hour for use of the urchin for cost recovery to help defray some of this. Right. Which I thought was an interesting hourly rental rate. Yeah, they, I haven't seen anything like that stipulating, you know, with the discovery. We basically, when we go offshore for those four days, it's based on a 12 hour period. And we kind of figured out what, you know, our cost was and then add a little bit to it to try to defer maintenance costs later down. Because we're to the point, the motor's got 2,800 hours on them. So they're coming to the point they need to be replaced. So since 1999, nobody's been putting any money back for motor replacement, shaft replacement. The generator went out last year that was a uh, $11,000, you know, pulled it. And that was just a generator. If I'd have carried it somewhere and said, hey, put a new generator in it, you're looking at $2,800, I think they said, to swap it out. So and then I'd had to carry it down to the marina, had it set out in dry dock so they could get their cranes in there to take it out. Me and 
my trusty helper, my wife Rose. We unbolted it, slid it down. I picked it up with a come along. We shut the hatches, set it on two by sixes, slid it up the way, got the tide just right to where when I slid it up the boat, up the gunnel of the boat on some two by sixes, we've got a cart there on the dock that it was the right height that it would go right on the cart. And I pried it up and we got the two by sixes out and rolled it down to the end and slid it off and went over to Green Cove Springs and got the new one and then reversed the process. So So you mentioned, uh, I think before the urchin um, and uh, Lee Belcher and sinking, is there a story behind that that you know? Or? Well, don't want to accuse nobody or nothing, but yeah, there was a story behind it. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't know what the so in the, in the archival documents that we saw, it was uh, um, essentially what the inspection report said that we found was that uh, it was taken out on the ways and then it was let to sit there, and as a result, it had some structural damage, and then it was put back, and then as a result, it sunk. Mm. And so I didn't know if there was a community story associated yeah, with Yeah, you know, anyway. okay. and that's what it was. They, you know, the story went around at that time was, you know, Lee was a marine biologist and he was requesting more money and they wouldn't. And, you know, his thing was he was going around the west end of the island and some, or actually the boat just sunk. <laughs> just up so and it was like that was you know a story that nobody never said lee intentionally sunk the boat but they, he didn't get his raise but the boat did sink and then he quit shortly after that so okay interesting yeah yeah the uh this was uh you know it, it appeared from the inspection report that it was sunk at the dock and that okay. as a result of being out of the water for i think it was i think the report said it was left out for um the better part of two years oh yeah to just sit on the waves and that was what caused its problem mm. that was the, the the linchpin problem that right. snowballed into other problems right so. so well kenny thank you very much for uh for talking with me today and i would like to do our little walkabout around the lighthouse um so you could uh, point out different structures and maybe tell an anecdote or two if you'd like. Nope, before. I'm through for today. That's it. That's <laughs> bonanza time. <laughs> but before we conclude this part, is there any other uh, story or um, piece of information about anything that we've talked about that you'd like to say? No, nah, no. You know, we used to come out, there is an old cistern under the main part of the house and uh -huh. Uh, the first time I knew about that was I'd come out with Henry and had the Boy Scouts and you know they all like to get in there and look around and we'd put them in there and once you shut the lid it's total darkness you know so we'd let them scream in there for a little while. That was after you told them about the big snakes that like to stay down there and uh, you know that's where the old pirates ghosts were and all that stuff but other than that it's always just been a good time out here so. Is that the hole that's in the front room? That yep. has the, yeah. Okay. Yep. That was open one time when I came here. Yeah. And I, I think I now. Sure I want to fall in there. Yeah, I think now there's some pelican, old pelican bones and stuff. There and, are bones down in there. Yeah. I saw them. And then somebody had <laughs> put a old skeleton in there, a Halloween skeleton, not calling no names, Rose. <laughs> 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 but uh. We had a group from New York used to come down. Uh, they come for a couple of years, and they were real. You could get them scared pretty easy. So <laughs> we'd done stuff to them, you know. So great. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Kate. All right, you're welcome.